Ni hao and welcome to episode one of my vlog um, focusing on Mao's China. And this is a vlog intended to particularly support A-level students who are studying the Edexcel course um, looking at Mao's China. And with that in mind, we'll look at the topics um, that they particularly focus on, the establishment of the People's Republic of China, um, the economic um, policies of, of Mao and his regime, the Cultural Revolution, and how that kind of unravels a lot of what uh, Mao had tried to establish in the previous decade and a half, um, and then the social policies uh, in Mao's China as well. However, um, the information is good for everyone and welcome even if you're not studying these things. Um, it's no exaggeration to say that this 27 years of Mao's time uh, in power is pivotal in the bigger story of China. Um, if you look at China in the 20th century, um, China in 1900 is very much a kind of pre-industrial, both economically and politically, um, pre-industrial country. No exaggeration to say that in 1900, it's maybe kind of in line perhaps more with um, where other countries might have been in 1700 or 1750, certainly at least 1800. Um, but by 2000, they had caught up with uh, the West and in some ways overtaken them. They're an economically dominant force um, and politically very strong too, and, and militarily um, as well in their, certainly their own region. So this is um, part of that story. Um, and in some ways, it's a confusing part of the story because it doesn't seem very successful. But in other ways, it's, it's, it's super, super successful in bringing China together and laying the platform, the political foundations for the country that we see today um, in our world. So um, that's what we're going to have a look at. And in this episode, uh, we're just going to lay some of the foundations for that by um, reminding ourselves or, or, or re-examining um, the, the half century leading up to um, Mao gaining power in 1949. Just before we start that, a couple of quick notes about things that you're probably already aware of. And first of all, as you're, um, I'm sure, completely au fait with, um, the Chinese language is very different than ours. And so two things about that. One is it does make places um, and names um, trickier for the Western tongue, and uh, particularly my inept Western tongue, to pronounce. So apologies uh, to anyone of any sort of vague Chinese heritage if I get names and places horribly wrong in my pronunciations. Secondly, if you're reading about um, uh, Chinese history, um, or indeed modern Chinese stuff, be aware that the um, English versions of names and places and companies and um, uh, and groups um, are transliterated. And what that means is they take a phonetic translation. They listen to how it sounds in Mandarin uh, or Cantonese and then um, put that approximately into English. What that does mean is that there is um, some variation occasionally in how that is, appears uh, in English. Um, a, a big example of this are the Kuomintang and the Nationalist Party who existed it ran China before the Communist Party. And sometimes they're referred to uh, or spelled with, with a G and their abbreviation is GMD. And sometimes they're referred to um, Kuomintang starting with a K and the abbreviation is KMT. So do just be um, a little bit alert to that. Uh, perhaps say things out loud in your head and think, is this the same person? Are these the same um, groups? Because it very well may be that they are. Uh, and then the second and hopefully again, obvious thing to say is that when you're referring to people um, in your essays um, and in your notes, just remember all the time that the first name that we pronounce is the family name. And that's the name that you should refer to if you're only using one name. So Mao Zedong is always referred to as Mao. He's Mr. Mao. Um, and that's the, the phrase we use. And so we would call Bismarck, uh, Bismarck rather than Otto Bismarck or um, Thatcher rather than Margaret Thatcher. It's Mao rather than Mao Zedong. Um, and the second name that we pronounce there, Zedong, is what they're known to, to their friends and family. With all that said, uh, let's wade in then. So a brief history of China before 1949. In 1900, um, the century opens with um, China still ruled by a monarchy um, and was uh, being ruled at that time by the Empress Dowager Cixi. Cixi is about as close as I can get. Um, and she was quite a dominant, powerful figure, um, but um, there were already some rumblings against her. And when she died in 1908 and handed control of the country, and I say control in the very loosest possible sense of the word, to the two and a half year old Emperor Puyi, P-U-Y-I, um, of course, the authority of the, the monarchy was weakened uh, and undermined as a result. 
And Pu Yi, incidentally, uh, is the subject of the 1987 film, The Last Emperor, which I'd really recommend um, if you haven't seen it already. A fascinating film, both about his life, um, good then for a, a you know, background um, understanding of, of some of the political um, and cultural um, history of China before 1949, but also fascinating because it was made in 1987 with the collaboration of the Communist Party in China. So um, really interesting about how they portray and why they portray uh, the communist regime as they do. And Pu Yi was the last member, um, last ruling member of the Qing dynasty of China. Qing is Q-I-N-G. Um, because in 1911, um, a revolution was started in Wuhan, which overthrew um, the monarchy. The monarchy was kind of like the glue that held China together. And um, in the next five years or so, um, a new kind of self-proclaimed Emperor Yuan Shikai tries to rule China, but with very limited central authority. And what actually happens from 1916, 1918 onwards for the next decades that China fragments into um, a load of decentralized um, portions. Um, this is called the warlord era because whoever had um, the biggest kind of militia or group of followers with weapons uh, ran their own bit of China under their own um, authority and using their own rules. And you can read about them. Some of them are horrible. Some of them are very progressive. Some of them are very um, uh, powerful. Some of them are quite weak and run small areas. But there's a lot of kind of fighting and, and, and very little central government. This period um, is the period where the Chinese Communist Party is founded in 1921. Um, and Mao is one of the founding members uh, of the Communist Party. In 1927, one of those kind of warlord groups um, who are called the Nationalist Party um, decide to make a bid to reunite China. Um, and these people are led by Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and they fight their way north from uh, the kind of southeast of the country up the eastern seaboard um, to Beijing, uh, partly through defeating other warlords and sometimes by making alliances with particular groups, including the Communist Party, uh, ally with them and help them to gain power. So in 1927, Chiang Kai-shek becomes the, the leader of China. But it's worth noting that all along, Chiang Kai-shek only has control of physically maybe about half of China, even with his alliances. He never quite establishes complete control of China. And that's really important when you're evaluating the success of Mao and the Communist Party in that very quickly they do establish an iron grip over the whole of the country. The other thing to note about Chiang Kai-shek is that super quickly he falls out with the Communist Party. And so you have the start of a lengthy civil war punctuated by the Second World War um, or the Second, well, the Sino-Japanese War, as they call it in China. And this is marked uh, initially by uh, what's called the Long March. So the Communist Party um, had several bases around the country, but quite a big base in Jiangxi province, uh, again, in the southeast of the country, um, south of Beijing and Nanjing. Um, and little inland from Shanghai. Um, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek attacks this, militarily attacks it, and the communists are forced to flee. Now, the Long March is a mythical event in the um, Communist Party history. It's kind of their, their founding event um, in many ways. Um, and for all the period that we're going to talk about, all the main leaders of the party have been present on the Long March. It's kind of their, their uniting moment of, of you, know, you had to be there to be a, a big wig in the party after it. But um, it is really, it's a long running away. It's not a long march. They're not setting out for anywhere. They are really just trying to escape the nationalists. And it's a kind of fighting retreat. It uh, lasts for five, uh, over five and a half thousand miles. And they end up uh, in the northwest of China. Um, and they end up there really because that's just about out of reach of the Kuomintang's um, uh, uh, authority and their, their military capability in a place called Yan'an, uh, Y-A-N-A-N. -A -A and that becomes their base um, from the mid thirties all the way through to 1945. It is on the long march that Mao becomes the, the predominant leader, not quite yet the sole leader, but the predominant leader of the Communist Party. And that happens um, through the process of a long march where Mao's decisions um, turn out to be um, more often correct 
um, even sometimes in retrospect, even if he's outvoted, more often he's kind of saying, like, oh, we should have done what Mao said. Um, so by the time they get to Yan'an, he is um, kind of like the, the, the most uh, prominent surviving leader who has, whose reputation has been improved by the Long March. That is the other thing to say, that on the Long March, about 80% of the people, uh, the communists on that march, die in the process of it. However, in Yan'an, they get some time um, to put to uh, put to practice uh, some of their policies um, that they have uh, thought about. And Mao, in particular, um, adapts Marxist theory to involve peasants. So Marxists thought peasants were not really part of the scheme at all. It was all about the urban proletariat, the urban worker. They were going to be the engine of revolution. Well, Mao looks around China, particularly looks around the northwest of China and thinks, hang on a minute, there aren't really any proletariat here. We're, we're a pre-industrial economy. And so he brings the, the peasants in to that system and says the peasants are going to play a key role um, in our um, revolution. And that's a big, uh, a big move um, ideologically and starts to put Maoist thought, Maoist Marxism on a slightly different track than Soviet Marxism, which we've perhaps thought about before. The other important thing about Yan'an is that when the Japanese invade, initially they invade Manchuria in the far northeast of the country. And then in 1937, they strike south towards Beijing and they push on down the eastern seaboard, the more industrialised, the more urbanised part of China. Um, in a kind of uh, a, a thick stripe of invasion, um, the communists are just to the left of that stripe. So Yan'an doesn't really get clobbered, whereas Chiang Kai-shek is, is completely in the middle of it and has to fight back against them. Therefore, in, this, in the Second World War, um, Chiang Kai-shek uh, and the Nationalist Party um, are the main opposition to Japan in China. And they struggle with that. Chiang Kai-shek is not a great military leader, but also the Japanese are very efficient and effective. Chiang Kai-shek has to pull back. And they flood lots of places. Lots of lots of Chinese die. The Japanese are really horrible to the Chinese population. <clears throat> um, and Chiang Kai-shek's reputation takes a bit of a battering. The communists, on the other hand, partly because they're in a slightly more secure position, uh, they're not really in a place that's um, super strategic for the Japanese to get. They're able to enact more of a guerrilla warfare strategy, um, running into Japanese territory, um, shooting a few Japanese soldiers, uh, sabotaging some Japanese infrastructure and pulling back. Um, and because of that, they're able to build a kind of a, a slightly more um, chippy uh, um, yeah, reputation, I think. Therefore, by the end of the, uh, the war, the Nazis already have a slightly bruised reputation, whereas the communists have been able to augment their reputation, I think, and, and look uh, just a bit like more like they're uh, um, on the side of the people. <clears throat> whereas the expectations of the government down because they were government were higher and so they've been a bit more damaged. Nevertheless, as the Second World War finished, um, the Kuomintang are in a much better position to finish off the Communist Party. They're both kind of quite big by now. Um, it's reckoned that in 1945, the People's Liberation Army, the Communist Force, um, are about 1.2 million uh, strong. Um, and they controlled about a quarter of the territory of China, um, but about a third of the population. They're also strengthened because the Soviet army um, give them the weapons that they liberate from the Japanese in Manchuria um, and other supplies that they had with them at the time. However, the Kuomintang had 1.6 million troops from about 1946, and they are given by the United States four and a half billion dollars of aid uh, in the next two years. Um, the America, this is kind of an American kind of Soviet uh, proxy war. Um, and the Americans strongly back Chiang Kai-shek. So they're in a good position, but for various reasons, over the next four years, um, the Kuomintang uh, end up being defeated. They're tactically not as uh, astute as the communists. Um, Chiang Kai-shek's leadership was corrupt, maybe not Chiang Kai-shek himself, but certainly the people around him were very corrupt and didn't pass on some of the cash that was given to them. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek uh, had a, an authoritarian, conservative government, whereas the Communist Party were much more populist um, in their stance on things, for instance, on land reform, which they were already enacting in the areas that they had. And so the upshot of that is that in 1949, 
um, on the 1st of October, Mao Zedong stands up uh, in Beijing and announces um, the establishment of the People's Republic of China, the, the communist victory in this civil war. At that point, China has been uh, economically devastated by years of fighting, both in the civil war and also by the Japanese. Um, and they weren't in a particularly strong position to start with. So the country is economically a mess. Remember that what we've said is that since 1916, uh, it hadn't been politically united. There is a lot of work for the commons to do to establish control and to get this country moving forward to modernize it. Added to which the Kuomintang, although they've been defeated, have fled from mainland China to Taiwan, um, just off the coast. Um, of Eastern China, and they remain a, a threat to the Communist Party that Mao hopes to deal with uh, in the short term. So 1949 is the establishment of the, of the People's Republic of China, but it's the establishment of the People's Republic of China at a point of weakness um, and where lots need to be done to, in order to bring the country um, into the 20th century. And next time we'll begin to see how they establish control of the country um, and how they begin to look forward to doing those things. Thanks for watching. See you next time.